Good evening and welcome to tonight's Doc Talks presentation in women's health, the importance of breast cancer screening. My name is Michelle Campbell, President and CEO of St. Joseph's Healthcare Foundation. We have hundreds of people signed in from all over the region tonight. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's presentation is part of our Doc Talk series featuring leading physicians and researchers at St. Joseph's Healthcare London. These health discussions were created to give our community valuable insights into how medical experts at St. Joseph's are tackling the pressing health issues of our time. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our corporate sponsors, CIBC and Seabrook Financial Group at CIBC Woodgundy for making tonight's presentation possible. We are incredibly grateful to CIBC for supporting the Doc Talk series, which enables us to share informative and relevant health information with you and your family. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Please note tonight's presentation is being recorded. In case you missed parts of the presentation or you'd like to share it with family and friends, it can easily be accessed along with all of our other previous Doc Talks presentation by visiting our website. And of course, we are sharing this presentation in a virtual online format. And as we all know, technology can sometimes be challenging. So if a technical glitch occurs, we ask for your patience as we sort it out. I did also want to note that due to the nature of tonight's subject matter, tonight's presentation does feature some medical photography. We encourage you to ask any questions you have for tonight's presenter using the Q&A function, which can be found in the top right corner of your screen. We will set aside some time at the end to answer as many questions as we have time for. We know breast cancer is a complex disease that will affect one in eight Canadians. So far this year alone, approximately 29,000 women and 300 men in Canada have received a breast cancer diagnosis. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Muriel Brackstone, will shed light on the importance of breast cancer screening and diagnosis, and more specifically, how you can become your own health advocate. Dr. Brackstone is a surgical oncologist and founding medical director for the breast care program here at St. Joseph's Hospital. She is also an associate scientist at Lawson Health Research Institute. In addition to completing two master's degrees in science and a PhD, Dr. Brackstone created the London Tumor Biobank, an important resource in the collection of specimens to enable scientific collaboration with other scientists to advance research innovation in breast cancer treatment. We're so proud of the work that Dr. Brackstone does here at St. Joseph's and in our community, and we're very fortunate to have her with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Muriel Brackstone. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the St. Joseph's Foundation for inviting me. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to all of you. And as uh, Michelle had mentioned, uh, at the end of this session, I am open to all sorts of questions and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding breast health. And really, I must say that this uh, discussion tonight is in part uh, thanks to the advocacy uh, of a friend of mine who I was uh, pleased to get to know, whose name is Carla. Van Kessel and Carla, I'll introduce briefly, uh, is was an incredibly bright, uh, hardworking mom of two young boys, a uh, librarian, and a very uh, um, strong health advocate. And she had been having routine pap tests and had certain pelvic symptoms and started to have some concerns. Went to numerous physicians, continued to go back, but because she'd had a screening test that was pretty normal. There were no concerns to continue to do more testing and things progressed and progressed and ultimately she was unfortunately diagnosed with metastatic cervical cancer. This is Carla during her treatment time and you can see here a, a, a healthy a strong woman who continued to run marathons even during chemotherapy. And part of her advocacy work during all of that time was to increase awareness about health how women should not be dismissed when they have concerns and that women should have access to uh, as many preventative uh, opportunities, preventive treatments, as well as screening tests uh, that they should uh, be entitled to. And for cervical cancer, that included HPV vaccination. And not all women are currently eligible or able to receive HPV vaccination. 
But in part, thanks to Carla's uh, strong advocacy work, I understand it's coming down the pipeline that it's going to be uh, increasingly available uh, for women to prevent this cancer. And thankfully for cervix, that's something that's almost entirely preventable with a vaccine. Additionally, because the vaccine causes cancer by chronically irritating the cells, one of the screening tests available is to actually look at the cells to see if they have the, the virus in them. Uh, and that is a screening test. And we're going to talk a lot about the difference between a screening test and a diagnostic test. But really, the purpose of that is to identify women who might be at increased risk and offer additional tests for them. So for cervix, if there are any changes, that would be colposcopy. Uh, and for breast, it would be a number of other tests that I'm going to describe. But really, one of the take home messages that Carla wanted to uh, disseminate to uh, women at large is that a screening test is not a diagnostic test. And so for cervix, for breast, for a number of other conditions, if you have a symptom, having had a normal screening test isn't enough. And so it's important to recognize that, bring that forward to physicians and continue to uh, advocate for your health until all of those concerns can be addressed. Unfortunately, Carla passed away from her metastatic cervical cancer. Uh, and and that really want to continue to um, support her advocacy work. And I want to show you how, even though that's a different disease site, there are important lessons that can be learned for breast cancer as well. And so for today, I wanted to talk about some of the common benign breast conditions. And the reason is that even though we see a lot of breast cancer at St. Joseph's Hospital, we see even more benign breast disease. And it's a really common concern. And so I want to demystify some of that. And also just to explain what are the normal procedures that we go through, because oftentimes when we do tests for benign disease, we triage patients and we see the cancers first. And we know really through the testing that it's probably nothing, but the patients don't know that. And so sometimes I think we do a disservice to women by seeing the more urgent cases first and forget to recognize that patients that have benign conditions, concerns that they brought forward, they don't know yet that they don't have cancer. Uh, and so that's really something that we need to do better. But I'm hoping by informing some of this information that we can increase the knowledge and that people can understand what the processes are around some of the different breast diagnoses. I want to review for breast, what are the screening tools? So what's old, what's new, what's coming, what can you expect? And really, again, to differentiate between a screening test and a diagnostic test. And this is something I see physicians get uh, into a lot of trouble having um, concerns, having missed diagnoses in patients because they forgot this fundamental difference. I want to review a little bit about uh, breast imaging reports so that you can see uh, what uh, comes in a report and what to look for. And then a brief overview if you are unfortunately diagnosed with a breast cancer, sort of in general terms, what you can expect and what's new. And then most importantly, how to advocate for yourself. So some of the most common benign breast conditions that we see, even more so than cancer, are the following four. A breast infection, nipple discharge, breast pain, and benign breast masses, which are really common. So in brief, breast infections can be infection of the whole breast. So when we think of that, we think of a big swollen red breast. And if you Google that online, the first thing you're going to see is inflammatory breast cancer, uh, and how scary that is. And so I wanted to remind you that actually people even while breastfeeding, but also when they're not breastfeeding or sometimes even after menopause, menopause can have infections of the breast that look red and swollen. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily mean an inflammatory cancer. What's important about that is that you see your family physician, they'll start you on antibiotics, and usually they go away quite quickly. If it goes away except one spot, sometimes there's a little abscess there. They do an ultrasound and you can drain it with a needle and continue your antibiotics. If it doesn't go away, that's when we want to do some breast imaging and make sure it isn't this really uh, more rare form of breast cancer. Infections of the breast are more commonly attributed to women that smoke, ironically, and often women who smoke have little abscesses that form along the edge of the areola. And so that's something to be uh, to bear in mind. Other conditions such as diabetes, uh, having had an injury to the area or a nipple piercing also increase the risk. 
Nipple discharge is another really common problem. And I think that we probably don't say enough that in most women that especially have had children or that have had an, an episode of breastfeeding, if, there's, if they squeeze their nipple, some discharge will come out. Uh, and it's just the residual fluid in the milk ducts. And so the problem is that it causes some alarm. And sometimes if, if there's, they squeeze extra, it can cause a little bit of injury to the duct on the inside. It might bleed a little bit, which looks even more alarming, which causes women to check again. And you check and there's more discharge and it continues to perpetuate. When in actuality, the only concern with nipple discharge that we have is if it leaks on its own. So particularly on one side, particularly one duct, if it's continuing to leak on its own of any color, really, we get worried about that. And that we want to do some imaging for. And we'll talk about what diagnostic imaging that we do. These are almost all benign, particularly uh, if it's bloody nipple discharge. It's usually a little polyp of the milk duct, what we call a papilloma. We often just cut that little duct out easy to heal, problem is solved. But we want to make sure that it isn't often a precancer, that'd be the most likely thing, and even that is really, really rare. So the most useful thing if there's nipple discharge is to do a mammogram and make sure there isn't any precancer change, and if there isn't, then we often cut that duct out because it's annoying. Breast pain is really common, particularly, I think, in women in their early 40s. I would say maybe a few years before this, the hormones are starting to cycle irregularly and you're starting to head into menopause. And before that time, I think that even though women are having periods, their hormones are probably a little bit all over the place and it causes a bit of chaos in the breast tissue and causes some pain. Sometimes it can be only one side. It doesn't have to be both sides. It can be in conjunction with periods, so on a monthly basis, or it can be all the time on one side for no reason. We really don't understand it very well. We're not really good at treating it, but what's important is that we do a mammogram and make sure we don't see anything else of concern. We add an ultrasound if it's on one specific area, and then we treat the symptoms. If it's related to cycles, we often will interrupt the cycles uh, with uh, hormone tablets, almost like oral contraceptives, without a break, and then that seems to settle the breast pain down. And if it doesn't, then we have other measures such as chronic pain, um, clinics where we try different treat treatments. Sometimes even just supportive bras and anti-inflammatories are enough. The other more common presentation is a, a breast lump. And I think that it's challenging for some women who have very lumpy breast tissue to differentiate between benign lumps and problematic lumps. And you might have had a problem at it, a benign lump before, but then you have a new lump and how can you tell, et cetera. And so I want to talk about some of these things, how, which, what we should be concerned about and what we should do and how we can diagnose to put these issues at rest. But I think the most important thing is if you find something new, bring it to the attention of your family physician. And that's the most helpful thing to document what it is. And then it can be assessed and followed serially to make sure that you get some resolution. Things to look for when we're worried about breast cancer would be a new lump. So in the guidelines for screening, they say that women don't need to check their breasts every month. And while we found in big trials that it didn't seem to make a difference if women did self-checks or didn't do self-checks, really when we charged women with finding cancers, adding the self-check didn't seem to make a difference to overall survival. But it is really helpful to know what is lumpy and where your lumps are and kind of know your own self. Because then if there's something that you happen upon, you'll know that that's different and that tweaks you to seek some attention. And I think that's important because then it's part of self-advocacy to say, this is new, uh, it wasn't like this before. And it might still end up being benign, but it might also be a concern. And in this way, we can resolve it. And so to know any new lump, to, to see the contour of the breast, does it change the skin over it? Does it change the nipple shape? Does it cause some dimpling? Does it cause leaking of the nipple? Is there redness over it or any other skin change? So any of these findings would be something that would be important to bring to your doctor's attention. So when you go to your family physician, they're gonna wanna know these. These are the, what we consider to be the risk factors for breast cancer. So it really, when you're calculating these, 
findings out, the family physicians trying to decide, okay, well, what is the likelihood? What are we talking about? Is this somebody really at high risk? Or is it someone who's not at high risk? And so to know that, we want to know how many times does this person cycle through hormone fluxes every month? Did they start their menses early? Did they go through menopause late? Did they not have any pregnancies in between, so no breaks? And for all of those years, the cycles of hormone up and down and up and down. And that probably increases your risk to some degree. Additionally, having had children laid or not having chosen or not been able to breastfeed, those are things that really just speak to, again, uh, a longer period of uninterrupted cycling. Similarly, using hormone therapy, particularly after menopause, some forms of them seem to be associated with a slight increased risk of developing breast cancer, usually during the time that you're actually in it. More importantly, family history. So by family history, we mean young onset. So particularly if you have a first or second degree relative that developed breast cancer before the age of 50, or serous ovarian cancer, or multiple family members, those are things that we want to know. Actually having had radiation, usually for Hodgkin's lymphoma, including radiation to the chest, having had that at a young age also does increase the risk. And having had previous breast surgery or previous biopsies, really mostly because it means that something was active, there were changes going on, there was probably a lot of activity, and that's what increases the risk of the time. What the doctor wants to know about the lump really is the characteristics of it. So that's why it's helpful to know when it's new, because you can say this is new this month. I just noticed this, and we have an idea of how long it's been there for. The size of it, where it's located, does it change? So often women will have cysts in their breasts, and cysts by themselves do not increase your risk of breast cancer. They don't mean anything, they don't turn into anything, but they're lumpy. And so it's challenging to diagnose and sort. So this lump may in fact be just a cyst. It may come and go or fluctuate with your period, and that will be reassuring. And one of the things that the family doctor or physician can do is then aspirate it. It collapses down, your lump is gone, we knew it was a cyst, problem solved. Knowing about any swelling or pain or changes to the contour of the breast is really helpful to give us an idea. Similarly with the skin changes, so knowing if it's red, knowing if there's any nipple discharge, all of the things that we talked about, and your general health, all of those things your family doctor will want to know. And then during a breast examination, these are the things that we want to look for on an exam. Now, if your family physician doesn't do a breast examination, then you might need to find a new family physician because that's an important part of your health, and that should be something that everybody feels comfortable doing. And in doing so, then it's a second person, not just you, assessing this area to say, yeah, I agree, this is really bumpy. Or I can't find it, where is this spot? I, it feels to me really normal. So that in itself is really reassuring. But a single focal hard lump that isn't kind of an extension of ropiness throughout the breast tissue, and it just stays kind of in that area of the gland, it might change the shape of the breast, it might retract or thicken the skin, all of those things are worrisome. This is an algorithm, not that I need you all to know it, but I wanted to show just to illustrate that there are a number of different ways that, that a breast lump might be um, targeted, and particularly for young people. So women in their teens and 20s will often get cysts or these hard solid lumps that are completely benign called fibroadenomas. And they can grow or fluctuate in size, but they don't turn into cancer. And so one of the ways to rule out a cyst is just to aspirate it, put a little needle, you suck out the fluid, and then you're done. If it's solid, it won't suck out the fluid, so then you wanna do some pictures. So if we remember, a screening mammogram is just to look with the mammogram that we'll talk about, but that diagnostic test to work out this lump include an ultrasound. So if women are young, they're less than 30, say, you know what, it's probably a cyst, it's probably these fibroadenoma, let's just go straight to the ultrasound. If that's what it is, we'll go right on there. Yep, that's what I thought. Then we're done. If it's not that, then we do the mammogram. So a woman under 30 might still end up with a mammogram, just not first. If women are older than 30, we say, okay, well, you know, there really could be something worrisome there. Let's just do both straight off the hopper. We'll waste less time. So they'll end up with a mammogram and an ultrasound. But I wanted to show you that the mammogram by itself 
might not be completely sensitive to catch a cancer. And that depends on the density of the breast tissue, which we'll talk about. But the more dense, the whiter the image, and then it's like a cloud. So you can't see anything because you can't see anything. But that doesn't mean something's not there. And so you have to do an additional test. But when you look at the mammogram and an ultrasound together, particularly for a lump, because you know where to put that ultrasound right away. So it's not like you're guessing and looking around. You put the ultrasound right where you can feel the lump. And if that's normal, then you know that you're okay. And in combination, it's almost 100% sensitive. So oftentimes, when a family physician feels something or wants to put you at ease because you felt something, they'll order the diagnostic assessment. A diagnostic assessment for breast is not just a mammogram. It's a mammogram and an ultrasound of that area. And if those together are normal, we often now will send a letter back to the family doctor to say, we didn't see anything. Re-examine your patient. If you continue to be worried, you should send that patient to a surgeon. So that's not to say never and it's resolved. It's to say there's nothing. And so the likelihood now is a fraction of a percent. Not zero, but a fraction of a percent. So then to bring it down to zero, check again. And if that whatever that lumpiness went away, everything is good, the mammogram and ultrasound are good, we're good. But if that concern exists still, then we want to hear about it. And so we expect a family physician then to send the referral and the surgeon can do the exam. And this would be a specialist who has had extra training in breast surgery and breast examinations and is comfortable to make that final determination if there's anything suspicious or not. When should we be worried? We should be worried if on the pictures there's something suspicious. And if there's something suspicious, then we need to do a biopsy. We need to take a sample, find out for sure so that we can make a plan to get rid of it. We also will be worried if there's a lump. So we sent the pictures, the pictures were normal, but the lump persisted. So that's where we say to the family doctor, we don't know. We didn't see this patient before they had their imaging. So I'm not sure, but I absolutely want you to check because if you remain concerned, that's good enough for me. I need to, to see this person and just to make sure that, and sometimes if there's this mismatch, what we call discordance, we end up taking that little lump out anyway. So you know what? There's one real way to find out and that's to cut it out. But we don't wanna do that to people if we don't have to. If people have a bloody cyst and it continues to reaccumulate, that's another thing to say, well, maybe there's a fluidy type of problem growing and that we need to cut that area out. Of course, if the biopsy is done and it comes back abnormal, then that, that we need to treat. Or if the biopsy is normal and it doesn't match with our examination or our pictures, then we worry about that too, because we did the biopsy, it showed nothing, but the imaging looked suspicious. And so that again is discordant, not matching. And so we're gonna cut that piece out anyway, just to be really sure. In summary, articulate your concerns. We wanna know, if there is something that you're worried about, the best way to resolve that is to actually know what specifically are you worried about? Which part are you worried about? What, how do we look at it? And so we, I've had issues when we, the lawyers reach me to, for an opinion uh, to say, what do you think about how this case was managed? Uh, and sometimes the request was done appropriately. The mammogram was ordered appropriately. The ultrasound was ordered but the concern was not articulated. And so the radiologist didn't know that the family doctor was actually really worried. So they didn't do the ultrasound because they didn't realize it was a diagnostic request. And so it's important to say what it is you're, you're concerned about so that we can actually say, well, we're actually worried about this lump. Can you look here at this five o'clock radiant? Look here. And if you say here, there's nothing, then I'm gonna recheck. And if on examination, yeah, actually, no, it feels okay. Then we're good. If not, I'm not gonna let it go. What if you had a normal mammogram? So this was really uh, the scenario that Carla found herself in with, from a cervix perspective. You had a normal screening test, then you find some abnormal symptoms and you say, well, I just had a normal test. It can't be that. It can't be a breast problem because I just had a normal mammogram and that's actually not true. And the, the problem with screening tests is they can't be 100% accurate because to be 100% accurate, you have to look at everything. So you would have to put everybody through a mammogram, an ultrasound, maybe an MRI, biopsies. You would have all sorts of what we call false positives. So you would put people through all sorts of procedures, excisions, biopsies to prove it was nothing. 
and we don't want to do that for everybody. That's completely normal. So you have a screening test that's not 100%, but it catches most of the things that are early or percolating or warrant further investigation. That's the purpose of a screening test. So it's not that it failed its job. It's that its job is just to tweak you to additional testing required. The diagnostic piece of it is to then take that and run with it. And so to say, look, this mammogram isn't completely normal. It needs further investigation. It needs a diagnostic component. So if it shows up as a lump, the diagnostic component is to do an ultrasound. And the ultrasound, if it's not completely normal, would then lead to a biopsy or an MRI. If it shows low calcium flex, but there's no lump growing, then the mammogram would prompt further what we call magnification views, extra squish and or a biopsy. So if I can leave you with one take home message, it's to say, that while screening tests are absolutely useful in saving lives and identifying lumps or problems that are really small at the early stage where we can readily fix them, they aren't by themselves the cure-all to solving the question, is there a problem there? If someone presents with a complaint or a symptom or finding, then that requires other tests, including um, ultrasound, and if the concern remains, a referral to a breast surgeon. So what are the tests that we do now? There's a few things that are new. So the old standard fare is the mammography, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, and now we're moving now increasingly to tomal synthesis or 3D mammography. So that's when you take multiple pictures and you layer them on yourself and you can scroll through and create a 3D image that the machine builds for the radiologist or contrast enhanced mammography. So that's when you take IV contrast, similarly to when you have a CT scan. And then the contrast lights up all the blood flow. So all of a sudden you see a mammogram with all the blood activity with the thought that increased blood activity is going to signal something where something is more active than it should be. Breast ultrasound, we'll talk about that as being an integral part of the breast diagnostic assessment. Breast MRI and its role. And then I also want to mention thermography that patients ask me often a lot about. I want to remind you that while cancer is breast cancer is being now increasingly cured and the survival and long-term outcome continues to uh, improve, it remains the leading cause of cancer death worldwide and the most common cancer diagnosis in women. So you can see that both in terms of diagnosis and in terms of cause of death. In men, it represents a fraction. So it's the 0.2% of new diagnoses of cancer in men and 0.1% of cancer-related deaths. So a screening mammography, as mentioned, is useful in people who have no symptoms. So nothing is wrong, you don't feel a lump, you have no concern, you're just doing it because you know that when you find something, you're gonna go present your complaint or your concern, and then you're gonna have it worked up. But while it's too small to be found, you're counting on the screening mammography to highlight if you need extra tests for diagnosis. And the value of this is catching it at the early stage when the cure rates are fantastic and the amount of surgery that you need for a small thing is tiny and then the cosmetic outcome is good and then usually you avoid chemotherapy so not just do you catch it early but you avoid a lot of the grief of treatment that we have to put people through when they're diagnosed at a later stage you can see that the introduction of obsp or ontario breast screening program mammograms made in terms of reducing cancer specific or breast cancer specific deaths. And so this is really information that I find useful when women come concerned about the mammogram, which is technically an x-ray. So it's a low dose focal x-ray just to the breast tissue itself. And if you've been through a mammogram, you put you know one plate on one side and one plate on the other side and you squish. Uh, and the radiation field goes through that. The amount of radiation that that tissue receives is tiny in relation to the amount of radiation we get by walking on the Earth's crust every day or taking a short flight to Toronto would be much more radiation by being closer to the sun than you would get from a screening mammogram. And the mammogram offers obviously a lot more benefit in detecting something really early. Having said that, we have to put a lot of people through mammograms in order to be able to uh, prevent one death. So we say, you know, for you maybe have to put a thousand women through a mammogram, for one of one woman to have benefited in terms of 
avoiding debt because of the Nanogun. So what, what we know or feel comfortable is that we're not getting side effects from the radiation because of the uh, mammogram that we're doing based on such a low dose and the fact that women who are screened with mammogram have better survival than women who are not screened by mammogram. Cancer Care Ontario is the screening program and it offers direct patient referrals. In other words, you can register and if you're in the age group, 50 to 74 in Ontario, and you don't have any significant risk factors, you go every other year. And what's good about that is it sends you reminders. Uh, if you are at slightly increased risk, you had a first of your relative with breast cancer, they can up it to every year. If you have a lot of density, you should also have your mammogram done every year. Otherwise, it's every second year in Ontario. What's helpful is we have a uh, mobile centers and we're trying to increase the access for everyone, but you can see on the map below that there's a lot in southwestern Ontario and there's a lot of underserviced areas in the northern regions. Even in London, where we have one of the busiest uh, breast cancer centers in Canada, we are probably seeing maybe half of the women in, our, in London region who are eligible for a mammogram screening. So maybe half of the women are doing their screening and benefiting from that. And this is what a mammogram looks like, and it's pretty squishy, uh, literally. And it was done in the top down in the side to side view, and it's uncomfortable for a couple of seconds. And what's important, I think, in London and where we really benefited is in our technologies that now have different tools. One is the rounded plate, so it's not as digging into your rib cage uh, and so uncomfortable. And so that's a lot more comfortable. Our technicians are unbelievable at positioning you and making this really weird test uh, completely um, manageable, honestly. And with the other feature that's new with some of these machines is they're self-compressing. And so you can actually yourself control the squish. And what's ironic about that is that people who do their own squish actually have great views and perhaps probably even better compression than when it's done by somebody else. Maybe because you can control it and you're not waiting for somebody to just completely squish you. Uh, but, but it gives a great view and then we know that we're benefiting from the screening. The mammogram, as mentioned, the screen mammogram is two views, top down, side to side. Women who have dense breasts don't benefit as much, so it's not as sensitive a tool. And so because of that, Cancer Care Ontario says, you know, the best way to manage something where it's not as sensitive is to do it more often. And, and that's really what um, cervical cancer screening was like as well. So if the pap test wasn't as sensitive, then you would do it every few years. And if you have a more sensitive screening test, like an HPV screen, then you don't have to do it as often because it's more sensitive each time. So now we're going to 2D and 3D, which is gonna give us a better view. So it shows you, um, it's hard, this isn't something you can scroll through, so it doesn't really get, let you appreciate the 3D aspect of it. But when you add the contrast enhanced, this has been a game changer. And this is something that we led the way and one of our radiologists, Dr. Kornecki in London, was really one of the top advocates to bring in IV mammogram. So it's weird to get an IV while you're having a mammogram, but it lets the blood flow show something. And you can really see in the center where the little lump is showing right there in the circle. If you looked to the left on the 2D, it really, it's hard to see. It kind of blends in with all the other breast tissue. The 3D, maybe it shows a little bit more, but it would be easy to miss with your eye. But when you see it in contrast, it sticks out like the light of day. And that became our go-to test, particularly in people that have all these other tests and it takes forever and they're from out of town and we just need one thing to sum it all together. Contrast enhanced mammography has done that for us. Then we know exactly what we need to cut, off, cut out. Thermography is not a replacement for mammography and there, it, there are appealing ideas to it. Thermography is looking at the heat signature. So nothing happens to the woman, you just take an infrared image, and where there's a lot of activity, the thought is, well, maybe there's a lot more blood flow. And if there's a lot more blood flow, maybe there's a cancer or something percolating there. Really, the problem with it as a screening tool is a screening test really should identify something that's either precancerous or early cancer, really, really, really at the early stage. 
And if you're already counting on the blood flow to have developed and something to have grown sizable enough that it's giving off heat, then it's probably not a great screening test because it's not early enough. And so if you look at the FDA and Health Canada, it is quite clear that this is not a substitute for mammography. And while some people still do it, it's not covered by OHIP, so it's expensive. And I've not seen it ever identify something that uh, was missed by conventional screening. Uh, and so we don't advocate it, but it is seen as an adjunct uh, for women who wish to do it. Breast density is important. And in the US more recently, there was a lot of talk about accountability to let patients know that if they have increased density, their mammogram might not be as good. And what do we do about that? So it seems like having denser breast tissue, not clumpy by feel, but dense on picture. So if you look to the right on the screening image, the A, the top left hand picture, is what we call fatty replaced. So it's got good see through. There's not a lot of dense gland in there. It's mostly fat which let's be honest, most of our breast is. And so there's a lot of shine through from the image. And so if there's something prickling, you're gonna see it. The category B has what we call scattered density. So it's kind of more whitish, like the pictures we saw before. But if something was brewing, you probably would still see it. The C is becoming more dense or heterogeneously dense. So it's becoming thicker like a cloud. And so it might be hard to miss, especially a small early cancer. And then D is really dense. And so it's really hard to see anything brewing in there. And so we have really struggled as a society to know what do we do about that. So we recognize that there's density. We recognize that the test that we use may not be as good for women that have dense breast tissue. So what should we do? And really the radiology, the Canadian Association of Radiologists have recommended that why don't we do the test that we know works, but do it more often so that if you see something, it's going to be in the progressive stage. You're going to catch it as it's developing rather than wait the full two years and then you might miss something at the early stage. And so if you have a lot of breast density, you should have a more frequent mammogram. And maybe we should add to that some sort of additional test, such as ultrasound. And so some centers are developing these automated ultrasounds instead of the one where you kind of for an hour span, you know, your eye glazes over and you're looking for something. That might not be the best way to check for something. But there are these new automated ultrasound machines that are just, I think, on the horizon. Where you, it's kind of like a plate and you put it on the breast and it catches a whole automated ultrasound image. And then from that, we use artificial intelligence or AI machinery or the software to pick out abnormalities. And then that tells us where to look. So that's probably where density is going to be managed best. And people that are high risk, then we know that mammogram isn't enough. First of all, usually they're denser. Second of all, people that, are, that have hereditary cancer, so they inherited a gene from their mom or dad. And you see often in that family tree a lot of breast and or ovarian cancer. And that gene lets the cells not repair the damages that happen over time. And so it's more likely that a cancer will grow uh, over their lifetime, sometimes up to 80% likely. So they're almost certain to get breast cancer. And so we need to watch it much more closely. So in those patients, we're more willing to accept what we call a false positive. So while it's annoying, we would rather check really closely and say, oh, no, yeah, sorry, that was nothing, that was nothing, that was nothing, because we don't want to miss the thing that it could be. And so patients that are at high risk end up having a mammogram every year plus a breast MRI every year. And an MRI looks like this. So it's what we call prone. It's in that hollow tube. It's with an intravenous. You can't do it while you're pregnant because the intravenous contrast is contraindicated. And you have to have your arms up and your breasts basically hang through a hole and the picture is captured below the table that you're lying on. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. So when you're looking at the screening versus the diagnostic testing, I think I brought the message home that the screening is really in patients that have no symptoms. You're gonna do the two images. If anything is brewing, if that's not normal, something's starting to percolate, then they draw you back in, they do the ultrasound, it may still be nothing, but at least you sort it out in a diagnostic assessment. A diagnostic mammogram, the radiologist is typically there because they wanna add extra tests at the same time. So those are booked differently and longer appointments. 
And those are the ones where usually you have the mammogram and they say, just sit here, I'm gonna check with the radiologist. Yep, you do an ultrasound and then you do it there. Just hang on here, I'm gonna check these images. Yes, he wants a biopsy and then you go ahead and do your biopsy. The surveillance, once you've had cancer, that's a mammogram to check to make sure it never comes back. And so those ones we're typically doing a regular mammogram, but we do it often when the radiologist is around so that they can agree, yeah, no, nothing's good. Still, we're still good. And we don't have to do any other tests. So why we don't want to add an ultrasound to every mammogram is because if there isn't a specific spot that's tweaked your attention, it's really hard for the eye, the human eye, to catch any change over such a 20 by 20 centimeter area of tissue that you're scrolling. It's not very effective. But it does capture or, or, or explain what the tissue looks like in one specific spot if someone's worried. And this is the algorithm for how we manage abnormal mammograms. So again, the point is not to learn this. The point is to show you that if a mammogram, a screening mammogram, comes back abnormal, the radiologist has to look at the old pictures. And you'll see that on the report. I'll show you how they look. They'll show you what years they looked at. And so you want to look at, say, it's 2022, it says compared to 2021, 2020, and 2018, no change. So then I know nothing's happening because it hasn't changed in four years. So if there's something new in comparison to the old films, then that's an abnormal mammogram. And then to the left, you have to have the diagnostic test, the extra ultrasound. And from that, the radiologist has to make a determination. So that's what we call the by rods. This is where the rubber meets the road and you make a call and they're going to assign a number to your mammogram. It's going to be one negative, two benign. So not negative, but like normal. So there's a cyst, there's a stuff like normal stuff, lumpiness, but nothing worrisome, nothing precancerous. That's one and two. So a by rods report of one or two, we're good. A bi rads report of three means it's probably benign, but you know what? Some of the cysts were a little weird. They, I can't be sure it's completely just a cyst. It was a little clumpiness. I just want to follow it. I want to keep a closer eye. So that's called short interval follow-up. So sometimes the downside of a screening test is you get sucked in to some shorter interval follow-up. And then that means every six months for two years. And if in two years that hasn't changed, we're like, forget it. You know what? I overcalled it. It's good. It's back to bi rads one or two. By rads four or five, the radiologist is starting to get worried. Four, they're like, mm, probably still okay, maybe it's a little five radioma. It's a solid thing, but it's probably nothing, but we should do a biopsy. Five is, I'm really worried, we should do a biopsy. So both four and five are going to result in a biopsy. If there's any abnormality from that, a surgical referral and maybe treatment. And if that biopsy does show cancer, if the biopsy does show cancer, and we're doing it early because we've been doing the screening test, the thing is small. There is no benefit to you from a survival perspective or a long-term outcome if you just took the lump out or you took the whole breath. So that's part of the benefit to doing screening is that if you're going to catch it early, you can just take it and a tiny rim of normal around it. That's it. Your contour stays the same. The shape stays the same. You don't have a huge scar. You don't suffer the annoyances of a mastectomy if you don't have to have one and you have the same long-term outcome, same survival. At the same time as the breast surgery, you always have to sample the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes from the breast are the primary draining filters. So if anything's coming off of that breast, trying to spread, kind of like infection, debris, junk, dead cells, tumor cells, they're gonna go through the filter first, and the filter's in the armpit. So the first set of armpit lymph nodes, we call them the sentinel nodes, like the sentinel guards of the army, the frontline dudes, if there's anything coming off of there, it's going to be there. You take those, you sample them, you send them to the pathologist, and you say, was there anything in there? No, then we're still early stage. If there was something in there, then we have to check everywhere else to make sure it hasn't gone anywhere. And usually it hasn't. Even if there's some cells of cancer in the lymph node, almost always there's nothing beyond that. So we take the lump, we take those lymph nodes out, and then as long as there's nothing else, which is almost always, then we add additional treatment and make sure it never comes back. Just in case one little cell escaped and is floating around looking for a home, then we have to bathe it in treatment. So you have local treatment to make sure it doesn't come back. Cut the cancer out, surgery. Add radiation. Radiation, I'll show you in a minute, 
basically gives you a sunburn to the breast and it's very effective, 75% at reducing the risk. So 75% re less risk of recurrence of cancer. And so the risk then, if you've had the lump and you've had the radiation, maybe less than 5%, probably more like 3% risk that it comes back in that same breast over the next decade. Then we add something in the circulation to make sure it comes back nowhere else. So if it's a high risk tumor, then we add uh, chemotherapy and or antibody treatments. So there are some tumors that have extra protein called HER2, and we have an antibody drug that kills anything that has too much HER2 on it, boom, kills those cells specifically. And it works the best with chemo. So you end up with chemo. IV chemo for breast does make you lose your hair, which women hate. It's usually once every three weeks, band out over three, four months. If it's not that, if it's not a high risk tumor, then we add hormone blocking tablets because most of the cancers in breast eat estrogen for food. And so if you give an estrogen blocking tablet, those cells starve and die. And now we found that even in women that have some cancer in their lymph nodes, once they've gone past menopause, those hormone blocking tablets are probably as effective as chemotherapy. We probably gave a lot of women chemotherapy that didn't need it in the olden days and we didn't realize that we are getting as much benefit from the hormone blocking tablets that are way easier to tolerate. Beyond that, mammograms once a year, and then that's it. Now, we do all these screening tests, so we find things so sim so small, but then how do we cut them out? How do we know where they are? So they're so tiny that we didn't even feel them. So now what we do is we localize them. So we use either radioactive or now increasingly a magnetic seed the radiologist implants it with a tiny little needle and it just sits there. So this is an example of a radioactive seed. Not enough radiation to cause any harm or risk, but certainly if you had one of these implanted and you crossed the border to go shopping, you would be stopped at the border. The detection there is so sensitive that it would identify this one tiny little radioactive seed. It's, it's called a brachytherapy seed. And actually these are the same seeds that we implant into the prostate for men that have prostate cancer. Only we'll implant, you know, 40 to 60 of them in one prostate and we use a single one right into the breast lump to identify it with my little detector. And I'll show you a picture of that. And then it becomes really easy to cut that right out. And then the radiologist who puts it in draws me a nice little picture, like on the left. So I said, here's that little lump. This is what I want you to cut out. I put a little seed smack dab in the middle of it. Oh, everything else around that's completely normal. Don't cut anything else out. Okay. And then usually a little scar right over the lump. If it's a bigger area, we do what, what we call these oncoplastic procedures. So there's more information about that on another doc talk um, that's on the website. Uh, but these oncoplastic reductions are basically breast reductions. If we have a big hollow, then we have to give a little lift to fill the hollow. But if it's a little spot, then oftentimes this is the kind of scar you might expect. And then we remove the lymph node to sample it. If there's a lot of cancer in the lymph nodes, we have to remove them all. And that's where people get the risk of lymphedema, maybe 10% of the time from having the lymph nodes out of the armpit removed, but not from having the sampling done. I've done tens of thousands of those sampling sentinel node procedures and not had anyone with lymphedema from it. But the purpose of that is to avoid the lymphedema because while it doesn't cause uh, loss of function is really annoying uh, and it can precipitate infections and and so forth and so oftentimes if people have a lot of lymph node disease now what we do is instead of going straight to the lymph node dissection or removal of the lymph nodes and the risk of lymphedema we give people chemo first we say you know what this cancer is more advanced we know that it's going to die quickly with chemotherapy we know we're going to give it to you after surgery so why don't we give it to you up front we call that neoadjuvant, neo before. If we give it to you up front, it's going to kill the cancer everywhere, including in the lump. It makes the lump smaller. You don't have to cut as much out. And including the lymph nodes. It kills all the cancer cells in the lymph nodes. Now we don't have to take them all out anymore. Now we can just do the sampling again and avoid the lymphedema risk. So we really are trying to push as much as possible to where there's a lot of lymph nodes doing the sampling after chemotherapy so we don't have to put people at risk of lymphedema. And the way we find these little lymph nodes, we can't just guess and willy-nilly take them out. We have to inject some dye. So we use a combination of blue dye, typically injected into the, day, the breast in the day of surgery, and then some radioactive fluid in the skin at the edge of the areola that smarts like crazy a few seconds 
before surgery. And then my little detector there finds that lymph node that's radioactive and takes that one out. And that's the primary draining one because the lymph fluid I injected travels in the same lymph channel as the cancer cells would have and highlights for me where those cancer cells would have gotten stuck. I take that out and I send them to the radiologist and, or the pathologist and say, is there cancer or not? And if there isn't, we're good. Afterwards, to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence, we add radiation. So radiation is in this position, your arms up, you're a little to the side, and the machine's like a CT scan is on the side, um, sort of a detector on either side. And it takes about 12 minutes, and you'll swear the thing isn't on for the first few sessions. And then slowly, like going to a tanning salon, you get a square sunburn, typically. Sometimes it blisters, usually it just looks red over the ensuing weeks. Right now, the standard is three weeks, Monday to Friday, no weekends. But it's really effective at reducing the risk of recurrence. And the way they deliver it now avoids uh, most of the organs and there's a really low risk of anything deep to the breast itself. How do you know if you need chemo? This is really new now, I think. We've increasingly gotten support for getting the um, OHIP to pay for these tests that are called genomic tests that actually take samples of the lump that we cut out scrapes all the DNA out of it, all the genetic material, and looks at these cells and say, there's a little formula that they can calculate based on the genes and says, are these cells even capable of creating a recurrence? And they assign a score. And if the score is low, we now clearly know, even if there was cancer in the lymph nodes, the score is low, there's no benefit to adding chemo. And these are the people that we probably overtreated the most. And so if it's not clear that you need chemotherapy, or if you're not convinced, then you want to ask if you're eligible for a genomic test like Oncotype or Mammoth Print. There are a number of different ones, and that's going to give you objective information about what is the risk that your cells even can mount a recurrence, because if the risk is low, you're done. Just a tablet and we're good to go. These don't apply for the what we call the aggressive kind of cancers. The formula doesn't work the same. And those are the HER2 positive ones that we said have too much HER2 protein. And for those, we have that antibody drug that works so well. Um, but the problem is that when it, the antibody drug works well in combination with chemo, so it does rope you into taking IV chemotherapy so that you can get the Herceptin that works amazingly at reducing the risk of it coming back. Additionally, the other aggressive kind of breast cancer is called triple negative. It doesn't respond to hormone blocking tablets, and so we don't have that option. We have to do chemo. But if it's estrogen positive, it's really important to know what is my oncotype score? How can I advocate for myself to minimize unnecessary treatment, to maximize the necessary treatment, to be heard, to be well followed, and to have the investigations that I need so that I understand and can help coordinate my own care? And that can include up to getting a second opinion. And as women, we should feel completely comfortable asking for a second opinion if we're not settled uh, in, in our minds about the treatment plan. And it does not hurt to get another opinion. I have sent people for other opinions. I've had other people ask opinions, second opinions of me or of my patient ask second opinions of someone else. And what's more important, is that people feel really comfortable with the treatment care that's provided. And so it's completely okay if you don't feel comfortable with a plan to get a second opinion. I wanted to show you what screening reports look like. And you may not ever get one directly to you, but the Cancer Care Ontario, the, the purpose of that in part was to deliver a screening test or program that was going to allow patients to get their own results. And the idea is great, you get a report, but actually this is something that Carla and her investigations of screening tests had identified uh, for me and similarly to cervix, it really gives you a generated report of a report. This is not your mammogram report by itself. It's a letter that interprets, someone interpreted your report and tells you it's negative or tells you instead it does not show signs of breast cancer, which really is is not what the screening test is technically doing, but it it tells you there's not, no abnormality detected in the mammogram, or it is abnormal. And if it is, it says it is abnormal, talk to your doctor, but it doesn't actually give you the report. So two things I take home from that. One, ask for your report. 
your actual report. And it's going to look something like this. It's going to say, here's the reason, screening. And then if it's not screening, you could say, well, actually, mine was diagnostic. Just so I, you know, just so you know, I had I had a complaint. It wasn't just a screening test. It's important to check that. It tells you what images were taken. It tells you who did it. It tells you what years they compared to. And then it tells you your density. So that's important too, because if it's heterogeneously or extremely dense, it lowers the sensitivity to the mammogram. You may want to do it every year. And then it tells you your bi rise. See, this bi rise is a bi rise one, which we all know now is negative. And then a recommendation. So it's important to actually see this because it gives you the information and it lets you corroborate with what your concern had been. Understanding your choices includes getting copies of these reports and keeping them. And I, I have no issue when people want copies of the reports. I think people should have access to all reports. And that includes access online, such as my chart or other online initiatives that we participated in to give women access to their own uh, electronic medical records. It's important to ask the risk, the percentage of benefit. What if I do it? What if I don't do it? What do I gain by doing it? What does it cost me by doing it? And side effects and the treatment. What do, you, what do you expect the treatment to, to go like? And does everyone agree? So the best way to get a whole bunch of opinions is to have your case presented at what we call the Multidisciplinary Disease Site Team Rounds, or MDT. And anyone that has cancer should have their case discussed or have the opportunity to have their case discussed. And at those rounds, which are every week, Every regional surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, pathologist, radiologist, all attend, everyone weighs in. And so automatically you're getting a regional opinion about your care. And so if I had a cancer treatment to go through, I would wanna know, did you present and what were the findings? Because if everybody says I need to do chemo, then I'm gonna take that seriously. But if there's a divergence of opinion, then I want a second opinion. And I think that that's okay because ultimately we want to feel settled in the care that we've received the best care available to us and that we don't worry about what it could have should have that we can put this diagnosis and treatment behind us and move on to our best life. Thank you for your time and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Brackstone. Um, my name is Ryan Byrne. Hello, everybody. I'm with the St. Joseph's Healthcare Foundation. <clears throat> so for the next few minutes, we're going to be addressing some of your questions that you have related to tonight's topic. So just as a reminder, please be sure you can still submit your questions through the Q&A bar on the right side of your screen. So let's get started uh, with the first question for Dr. Brackstone. So if someone is concerned about potentially having cancer, what is their first step or who should they reach out to first? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think the most important thing to do first is to talk to your family doctor. And we all have varying relationships with our family doctors, but it's important to, to say this is what I found, this is what is different, and this is what I'm concerned about. So again, articulating a specific concern they say, I'm worried this lump I can feel. I'm worried this skin is thick. I'm worried about this. Uh, and then they are your best first advocate to get additional testing. The testing would be the imaging, the diagnostic imaging. And then if that comes back normal, like I said, we send that letter to say, this is negative, but re-examine your patient. And so have that expectation that they're going to want to meet you again and check things again until we get to resolution. And if there is no resolution and it's still there, then to ask for, for a referral. And usually they're quite good and they're keen to have that referral sent also because they would like a specialist to weigh in. And so that would be the next step. Thank you. This one is about imaging. So how safe are diagnostic mammograms, specifically 2D and digital breast tomosynthesis or the combo of those? The exposure is double to just screening for a mammogram. So the association, the Canadian Association of Radiologists and Canadian Society of Breast Imaging says the exposure is within acceptable dose limits. However, the word acceptable is not reassuring at all. I recently had this type of mammogram at age 46. So the test is recommended for people who have a breast symptom. Although my test was normal, I worry about the long term risks of radiation. Yeah, and that's a very fair point. And it's true that additional tests such as three dimensional pictures or tomosynthesis 
is a layering of so it's like having multiple mammograms at different depths so that you can stack the images similar to a CT scan. So a CT scan has, of course, a much higher dose of radiation than a mammogram because of that multiple image acquisition. And so while the dose is higher, I understand your concern. I think that we have to look at where the radiation dose is delivered. So if you look, for example, at um, a border, you're crossing the border and you're going in the scanner. So you're going in the uh, the CT scanner. If they're saying low dose, but low dose where? It's a low dose if you distribute it over the volume of your body, but at the surface, it's actually high dose to the surface contact of the skin. And so where the dose is depends on where the toxicity is. So when you're looking at high dose to breast tissue, soft tissue, fat and skin, tolerates high dose very well. Radiation dose to thyroid, to brain, to other important structures, not so much. So where we worry about radiation, we, I think, blend the tissues that tolerate it fine where we don't see grief and the tissues that don't tolerate it fine where we need to be worried about dose. But some of the things that we don't think about are the amount of radiation that we're getting off of the Earth's crust every day and the amount of radiate, the solar radiation that we're getting um, just from, from being on Earth or from being in a flight are actually mountains higher than this tiny dose of radiation. And so we have to, it's true, while there is still some dose, we have to balance it against um, the benefit in terms of improved survival. So that's, I think, really the only thing that we can hang our hat on to say, yes, we recognize it's a dose. No, we're never going to know the, the safety features of every dose because no person in their right mind is going to have a study where they're willing to have subsequent doses and be followed forever. We're not going to have that information. So all we can rely on is look at what how better people survive if they do that test versus if they don't do that test, even if it's twice the test versus not doing the test. And right. so while we can have the standard 2D, if there's something that they want to check, that we feel that that's worth the, that risk, even though it's tiny. Thank you. This is just a question for clarity, Dr. Braxtone. Um, someone believe they heard you say that self-examination didn't lead to any improvement of survival rates. Has there been any studies done about this practice? So this really came out of the initial OBSP. So when we were looking at mammography screening, the, the Canadian 25 year follow up of a screening test. So these were women who were randomized to having the mammogram or not having the mammogram. It included a breast assessment, a breast exam versus not a breast exam. And then we had for some portion women do monthly tests versus not do monthly tests. And it seemed to not make a difference. And so over time, the women's self-exam fell out of favor because it really didn't seem to be catching things sooner. If we said, check your breast every month, if you find a cancer, let us know. And it didn't seem to translate an increased difference. So those are the trials, the initial validation trials that were showing the benefit of mammograms initially included the breast exams and then that seemed to fall out of favor. So we don't recommend it currently, but I think that there's nothing more powerful than a woman saying, I know myself and this isn't right. And so in that way, while it may not for everyone benefit in terms of an outcome and survival, it will absolutely highlight a problem to someone who's on top of it and get, I think, more expeditious care when you know that there's an issue and you know exactly what it is. Good advice, thank you. Um, this is about diet. Does cutting out soy products help decrease risk of breast cancer? Does diet affect breast density such as caffeine? If yes, is decaf coffee a good alternative or is it a chemical in coffee that affects breast density? These are all really good questions and we think that breast density is in part menopause related, so denser for younger women and also probably the nature of their breast tissue. So they have a lot of active tissue, they inherited this density, and that's the way that they're built. And so we don't have evidence that caffeine or uh, dietary changes influences the density of the breast, except perhaps over time, as we get older, maybe a little bit more weight, and we gain some fat that intersperses the dense, the dense breast and it gets a little less dense over time. Okay. With regards to soy, really, there's no study to show that, but there is a study where they looked in um, uh, Japan at women who had high soy diets and women who did not. 
And these were women who had cancer that were estrogen fed. So estrogen positive cancers who were on tamoxifen. And the women with the high soy diet actually had a slightly better outcome than the women who didn't. And so really that together shows us that plant phytoestrogens or plant derived medic, um, molecules that look like estrogen, which is what soy really can be, uh, is not associated with an increased risk of developing cancer or a recurrence of your cancer. Okay, this is um, a personal question from one of our listeners. I am a BRCA1 positive mm -hmm. and have had breast and ovarian cancer. If my daughter didn't test positive for BRCA, is she still considered high risk for breast cancer and should she start screening earlier than 50? So she does qualify for sooner uh, screening. It depends on the age of the first breast cancer diagnosis. So typically we'll say for first degree relative who doesn't have the mutation, so all of a sudden her risk is really reduced, but we would call her elevated. So she has a first degree relative, but she does not have a hereditary mutation. We would typically screen those patients starting at 40 or 10 years younger than the diagnosis of breast cancer. Okay, thank you. Um, as a person who had breast cancer three years ago, and bracket and a patient of yours, smiley face, I am two and a half years into my hormone therapy. How is it determined how long we stay on the therapy? I have heard five years, but possibly 10. How is that assessment made? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And the long and the short of it is that we do huge trials because women with hormone sensitive cancers that are on tamoxifen or on aromatase inhibitors, hormone blocking tablets, the risk of recurrence is really reduced. So the problem is, the problem, it's a good thing, but we have to treat so many more people in trials. The trials become huge and we have to follow them for so much longer to see even any bad outcomes. And so that's good, but because of that, the studies aren't done lots of different ways. So they're done once. They're like, you know what? Here's just tamoxifen, let's do it for five years. Boom, I just guessed that. And they're like, you know what? That really worked. So now, from now on, people aren't going to well, maybe we should do for four years and for three years. And I'm like, I'm going to repeat like a multi million dollar trial again to compare three years versus two years or two years versus four years. It probably, it probably doesn't have to be five years, but five years was the big pivotal study. And it showed such a, a benefit that everybody stuck with it. And the only time that changed was in younger women. One study is repeated saying, you know what, five versus 10. And actually, the way they did it is they continued that same study. They're like, you know what, everybody that was on that, study of five years, can all of you sign up again for another five? And then we're going to randomly give you the thing or a sugar pill. And then people that had the 10 years, the five plus five, had a slightly better outcome than the people that had the sugar pill. So then all of a sudden now we're saying, you know what, in young women, we probably should do 10. But in postmenopausal women, that's a different it's aromatase inhibitor, slightly different molecule, still a hormone blocker, but it works a little differently. We were stuck at five. So those trials are ongoing, but it's going to take a really long time before we know whether 10 is better than five. Thank you. One, one last question before we, um, we close off the event tonight. Um, what other kinds of lumps are common? Example, uh, necrosis. Okay, so, so the most common in young women are cysts and fibroadenomas that we had mentioned. Fat necrosis is another uh, pretty common finding usually in people that had surgery. So often in women that had either breast surgery for cancer before or breast reductions. So women that had breast reductions, when you have surgery, you cut a piece of the breast out and you bring these two pieces together and you put some stitches and where you brought it together, little edges can die and make a little cyst of oil and a little clump of dead fat. And sometimes you feel that and sometimes you don't, but it shows up on ultrasound. And when that happens, usually some of it will settle and it will what we call mature into a little oil assist and some of that will get absorbed and some of it will stay like a little scar of dead fat. And so that is really common, but typically in people who've had surgery. Got it. And one more thing just to touch on, Muriel. Um, you know, we think about London and we think about our, our biobank, which you've led um, so graciously with the support of our donors. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the benefit? How important is our biobank here at St. Joseph's? Yeah, so it's been actually instrumental in a number of different trials. And so I get excited when I talk about that because it is really hard to get these kind of things off the ground. Uh, and so we could never have done it 
without donors in truth. Um, but because of that, we were able to start to collect. And at first you don't have very much, you don't have very much, but then all of a sudden you have thousands of women providing additional samples of blood, of tissue. And we've we've been able to participate in a number of clinical trials. So I think the most important benefit is that because we're collecting at the time of diagnosis for women who are eligible for trials, for example, avoiding radiation in favor of hormone tablets only, that study is ongoing currently at St. Joe's, um, adding short fractions of radiation to prime the immune system, like a little in situ vaccine, that study is going on at St. Joe's. There are um, probably a dozen trials active we take the sample that you donated to Biobank as the pre-treatment sample, and in the next sample of surgery, then you don't have to go back and get another baseline because most trials, you have to go give another sample. You want to have that biopsy again, but because you donated, you already have one banked for you. And so that's the immediate benefit to participants, but also then we're able to collaborate. So we have collaborations across the world with different scientists to look at new drugs. So right now we're looking at a new drug for women who whose cancer recurs that are hormone sensitive to try a new medication so we can better understand it and figure out how it's gonna work. And that doesn't necessarily benefit the patient that's trying it, it benefits other women. So we have women taking this medication for a couple of weeks so we can do samples so that they can inform other women and, and, and help those women live long lives. And so those kind of studies are, are ground, groundbreaking really. Thank you. Very important work. I'm going to wrap up our Q&A and pass it over to our foundation CEO and president, Michelle Campbell. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Braxton, thank you so much. What an amazing talk. And I'm so glad that we taped it because I'm thinking uh, of all the women, friends who couldn't join us tonight uh, that I need to send this to, family members, what have you, really relevant, usable, uh, informative information, and, and some really great messages uh, that, that are real takeaway that I think really mirror uh, Carla's messaging as well. Screening is not a diagnostic test. Uh, you've got to monitor yourself for changes. We know what those changes are, what to look for. Uh, articulate your concerns, advocate, and advocacy matters. And I think those are all uh, amazing messages. Uh, amazingly important topic, and you covered it so well, so well. Thank you so much. We'd like to dedicate tonight's Doc Talks presentation to Carla Van Kessel and her family, many of whom have joined us online tonight. Thanks to Carla's efforts and her family's continued mission of health advocacy, Real changes to screening and how women are notified of test results could soon be a reality. And we're very grateful to them for that advocacy. And I want to add my own voice to Carlos in that regard. A year and a half ago, I personally received a diagnosis of breast cancer, a cancer that was caught in time as a result of a routine screening. And thanks to that screening in our breast care program here at St. Joseph's and the amazing work of Dr. Braxton and her team, I have made a full recovery. And now to share some good news. Doc Talks is soon to become a podcast. Starting next month, award-winning journalist and London Free Press columnist Ian Gillespie will be interviewing physicians and researchers from across St. Joseph's. Put your headphones on or your earbuds in, sit back, relax, and enjoy listening to Ian's common sense interview approach with some of our greatest local medical talent. You just heard from one of the best tonight. Visit our website for more information about that podcast. And again, thank you to our corporate sponsors, CIBC and the Seabrook Financial Group at CIBC Wood Gundy for their strong support for tonight's presentation. I want to thank our community supporters who make so much possible at here at St. Joseph's. A lot of the technology that Dr. Braxstone spoke about has actually been supported uh, through private funding from donors here in our community. And that support has really enabled St. Joseph's to stay at the medical forefront of technique and research in breast cancer, uh, which has really created better outcomes for our entire community. So I wanna thank you for enabling St. Joseph's to make that investment in care, teaching and research. Be sure to stay tuned for more upcoming Doc Talks presentations later in the year. And of course, our new podcast program. Thank you again for joining us and have a great evening.